Jerry Salzman, president and everything else. Peter Kaufman, our resident wise man. <laughs> Michelle Stevens, secretary. And uh, Two Toe, the controller. And um, Mary Jo Rodriguez, vice president, and a very important person here. Uh, Ellen Ireland, inspector of elections, and uh, Ernest Miranda and Martin Casas of Square Milner LP, our independent registered accountants. We'll now proceed to the journal, uh, Daily Journal Corporation formal business, and we'll go through rapidly, and then we'll I'll speak brief, briefly and take questions. If anyone needs help, raise your hand, and somebody will help you give a written voting thing. Ellen, will you please report of the number of shares represented at the meeting? On December 21st, 2018, the record date fixed by the Board of Directors for determining the shareholders entitled to vote today, there were 1,380,746 shares of common stock of the corporation outstanding. I have a list of the shareholders who were of record as of that date, certified by the corporation's transfer agent, Equinity Trust Company. I also have an affidavit certifying the completion of the mailing of the notice of this meeting, the proxy card, and the 2018 annual report, along with a prepaid postage return envelope to the shareholders. Proxies representing 1,243,845 shares of common stock entitled to vote at this meeting have been filed. The total number of shares represented in person or by proxy at this meeting is 1,243,845, which is more than a majority of voting power of all outstanding common stock of the corporation, and the meeting may proceed. I will attach the affidavits to the meeting, minutes of this meeting and have a copy of the minutes of the last annual meeting. Uh, since we have enough votes in present and a majority for election of all directors, we uh, announced that the directors have all been reelected, and and uh, then we have Mary Conlon also. Don't we have one new director, right? Mary Conlon, will you raise your hand to the? <laughs> Mary was an important executive at Pixar before they sold out to Disney. So she has satisfied one of our requirements that all directors be rich. <laughs> we also like them young and good looking, but we failed everywhere else. <laughs> the, uh, well, I announced that all those people are now elected as directors, and we now have to approve this amendment to the bylaws, uh, which accomplishes all that. The third proposal is the uh, election of the sixth Director, that's Mary Conlon, and that's just happened. And the people of the, the inspector of elections has evaluated the votes, and everybody has a, a, a majority. And I won't go into minor differences in the voting, because I usually end up badly off. The audit committee of the board has selected Square Milner LLP as our accountant, so we need to ratify that selection. And that's happening, too, as the proxies are voted. The inspector's election has tabulated the votes, and there are enough votes to do all that, and all those formal matters have now been done. Jerry, is there anything else I'm supposed to do? That's it, Charlie. It was very burdensome. <laughs> so many of you have come from such great distances. I'm going to speak briefly on a number of topics that may interest you. Uh, and then I'm going to take questions. The, it's amazing the number of people at the meeting of the little Daily Journal Corporation, which after all is a pretty small operation. We've got two businesses, one a steadily declining legal newspaper, which now earns about a million a year pre-tax and shrinking, and a computer software business where we're trying to automate courts and justice agencies and various other governmental departments. And 
that is now bigger by far in terms of prospects and customers and employees and so forth than our shrinking newspaper business. And it's hardly a, can be imagined how hard it is to deal with a whole bunch of different courts in different states and their advisors and the RFP process and the bureaucracy. This is a part of the software business that the giants tend to hate. They like a business where you just stamp out an extra copy of something and 98% of the revenues go immediately into the till as cash and there's no extra work. And that is not handling a bunch of uh, justice agencies, attorney generals, state courts, federal courts, and so forth all over the country with different requirements, different consultants, and of course, steady and aggressive competition. The nature of the, our business, it's more like technical consulting than it is just stamping, stamping, stamping out software. It's a very high service business. It's very difficult. The computer science is time consuming and difficult, but just dealing with that much bureaucracy over that many different fields with the political realities and the, it, it's just immensely difficult. So it's a very slow grinding business and that's the nature of the game. We've always liked it because a business like this requires you a company that's very rich and very determined and is willing to keep plugging. And of course, that's what the Daily Journal has done. How are we doing? Well, that's hard to judge, but I would say, watching it quite closely, that it's like a pharmaceutical company with seven wonderful drugs in the pipeline. We have a lot in the pipeline that is very, very important to us. Australia, Canada, California. We're talking big, big markets. And our main competitor is Tyler Technologies, which is listed on the New York Stock Exchange. And of course, they've been at it a long time, and they're way bigger. And But we are getting some significant volume, and we have some very pleased customers. And how in the hell does the Little Daily Journal Corporation attract the government of Australia. Australia is a big place, but I've gotten to love the Australians, and, <laughs> and I think it's going to succeed in Australia mightily. And so it takes a long time, and it's hard work, and it's also very difficult work. Not everybody can do this. It's just the mass of complexity. We would never be where we are if we didn't have Jerry Saltzman to do everything he's done over the last 10 years. Anybody else would have failed at this. Now, Jerry is 80, and, and he and I have one kind in common. We both use canes. <laughs> when I'm not in a wheelchair, I use a cane. And, and so the idea of taking on the whole world when the chairman is 95 and the vice chairman is 89 and the chief executive that does all the work is 80 and uses a cane. It's a very peculiar place that you people have come a long way to. What the hell are you thinking about? <laughs> it's weird. And what's happened, of course, is that we're standing a bit for some combination of basic morality and sturdy common sense. And it's amazing how well Berkshire Hathaway and the Daily Journal, for that matter, have succeeded with nothing more than basic morality and sturdy common sense. But of course, when people talk about common sense, they mean uncommon sense. Every time you hear that somebody has a lot of common sense, it means he's got uncommon sense. And it is much harder to have common sense than is generally thought. Let me give you an interesting example. In the investment world, People, it involves an enormous amount of high IQ people trying to be more skillful than normal. You can hardly imagine another activity that gets so much attention. And weird things have happened. And years ago, 
one of our local investment counseling shops, a very big one. Just they were looking for a way to get an advantage over other investment counseling shops. And they reasoned as follows. We've got all these brilliant young people from Horton and Harvard and so forth, and they work so hard trying to understand business and market trends and everything else. And if we just ask each one of our most brilliant men for their single best idea, then created a formula with this collection of best ideas, we would outperform averages by a big amount. And that seemed plausible to them because they were ill-educated. That's what happens when you go to Harvard and Wharton. And, <laughs> and, and so they tried it out, and of course it failed utterly. So they tried it again, and it failed utterly, and they tried it a third time, and it also failed. And of course, what they were looking for is the equivalent of the alchemists of centuries ago who wanted to turn lead into gold. They thought if you could just buy a lot of lead and wave your magic wand over and turn it into gold, that would be a good way to make money. So this counseling shop was looking for the equivalent of turning lead into gold. And of course, it didn't work. I could have told them, but they didn't ask me. Now, the, the interesting thing about this situation is that this is a very intelligent group of people that's come from all over the world. You've even got a lot of bright people from China where people tend to average out a little smarter. And, and the, the issue is very simple. It's a simple question. Why did that plausible idea fail? Just think about it for a minute. You've all been to fancy educational institutions. I bet you there's hardly one in the audience who knows why that thing failed. That's a pretty ridiculous demonstration I'm making. How can you not know that? It's sort of the main activity of America. It's an obvious, important failure. Surely we can explain it. You have to have stayed awake in your freshman college courses to answer that question. But if you ask that question at a department of finance, at a leading place, the professors wouldn't answer it right. Now, I'm going to leave you that question, because I want you perplexed. <laughs> and I will go on to another issue. <laughs> but that's one you should be able to answer. It shows how hard it is to be rational on something very simple. How hard it is, how many kind of crazy ideas people have and they don't work. You don't even know why they don't work, even though it's perfectly obvious if you've been properly educated. And by the way, my definition of being properly educated is being right when the professor is wrong. Anybody can spit back what the professor tells you. The trick is to know when he's right and when he's wrong. That's the properly educated person. And of course, they're frequently wrong, particularly in the soft sciences. In fact, if you look at a modern elite institution, it's fair to say that a lot of the faculty are a little crazy. It's so left-wing now in the humanities, and it's very peculiar. And that's another thing. Why should 90% of the college professors in the humanities be very left-wing? I leave that question for you, too. But it happens. And uh, another issue, of course, that's happened in the world of, of stock picking, where all this money and effort goes into trying to, be trying to be rational, is that we've had a really horrible thing happen to the investment counseling class. And that is these index funds have come along, and they basically beat everybody. And not only that, the amount by which they beat everybody is roughly the amount of, un, of cost of running the operation and making the changes in investments. So you have a whole profession is basically being paid for accomplishing practically nothing. This is very peculiar. This is not the case with bowel surgery <laughs> or even the criminal defense bar and the law or something. They have a whole profession where the chosen activity They've selected they can't do anything. Now, in the old days, the people in the profession always had some of this problem. And they rationalized as follows. 
We are saving our clients from the insurance salesman and the stockbroker, the standard stockbroker uh, that serves the active trader. And they were saving people from the life insurance salesman and the hustling stockbroker who liked active trading. And I suppose in the sense that the investing class is still saving those people from an even worse fate. But it is very peculiar when a whole profession that works so hard and is so admirable and the members of which we are delighted when they marry into our families and they just can't do what the profession is really trying to do, which is get better than average results. How is that profession handling this terrible situation? As index investing gets more and more popular, and including by a lot of fancy places, well, I'll give you a very simple answer. They're handling it with denial. They have a horrible problem they can't fix, so they just treat it as non-existent. This is a very stupid way to handle a problem. <laughs> now, it may be good when you're thinking about your own death, which you can't fix, and just denial all the way to the end. But, but in all the practical fields of life, this problem thoroughly understood is half solved or better coped with. So it's, it's wrong to have all these people in just a state of denial and doing what they have always did year after year and hoping that the world will keep paying them for it even though an unmanaged index is virtually certain to do better. It's a very serious problem. And think of how much New York, say, needs a flow of money from finance. Think what would happen to Manhattan if there weren't any fees for investment management or trading spreads and so on. So it's, it's a weird situation. And of course, it's, it's unpleasant. Big investment counseling shops, some of them shrink and some go out of business. And the value investors, of course, who many of I know because we came from that tradition, the value investors who are honorable are quitting. Boom, boom, boom. And they, they, what worked for them for years stopped working, and they, they're honorable people, they just quit. And they're also rich, so it makes it easy. <laughs> but those who aren't rich are, have a hell of a problem. And it costs about $50,000 to say in Manhattan to send your kid to preschool, <laughs> non-deductible. And, and that's just the start of an endless procession of years of vast expense. So if your game is money management, you have a serious problem. And I don't have any solution for, for this problem. I do think that index investing, if everybody did it, won't work. But for another considerable period, index investing is going to work better than active stock picking, where you try and know a lot. Now, at a place like Berkshire Hathaway or even the Daily Journal, we've done better than average. And now there's a question, why has that happened? And the answer is pretty simple. We tried to do less. We never had the illusion we could just hire a bunch of bright young people and they would know more than anybody about canned soup and aerospace and utilities and so on and so on and so on. We never had that dream. We never thought we could get really useful information on all subjects, like Jen Kramer pretends, tends to have. <laughs> and, and we always realized that if we worked very hard, we could find a few things where we were right, and that a few things were enough, and that that was a reasonable expectation. That is a very different way to approach the process. And if you would ask Warren Buffett, the same thing that this investment counseling did. Give me your best idea this year, and you just followed Warren's best idea, you would find it worked beautifully. But he would try to know the whole, he would give you one or two stocks. He had more limited ambitions. I had a grandfather who was very useful to me, my mother's grandfather, and he was a pioneer, and he came out to Iowa with no money but youth and health, and took it away from the Indians. He fought in the Black Hawk, he was a captain in the Black Hawk Wars, and he stayed there, and he bought cheap land, and he, he was aggressive and intelligent and so forth, and eventually he was the richest man in the town and on the bank, and, and, uh, and highly regarded, and 
huge family and a very happy life. And he had the attitude, having come out to Iowa when the land was not much more than a dollar an acre, and having stayed there until that black topsoil created a modern, rich civilization and some of the best land in the world. His attitude was that in a favored life like his, when you were located in the right place, you just got a few opportunities if you lived to be about 90. And the, the trick in coming out well was seizing a few opportunities that were your fair share that came along when they did. And he told that story over and over again to the grandchildren hung around him all summer. And my mother, who had no interest in money, remembered the story and told it to me. But I'm not my mother's natural imitator. And I knew Grandpa Ingham was right. And so I always knew from the very first, when I was a little boy, that the opportunities that were important that were going to come to me were few, and that the trick was to prepare myself for seizing the few that came. This is not the attitude they have at a big investment counseling thing. They think if they study a million things, they can know a million things. And, that, and of course, the result is almost nobody can outperform an index. Whereas I sit here with my Daily Journal stock, my Berkshire Hathaway stock, my holdings in Lilu's Asian fund, my Costco stock, and of course I'm outperforming everybody. And I'm 95 <laughs> years old. And I frankly never have a transaction. And the answer is I'm right and they're wrong. And that's why it's worked for me and not for them. And you know, the question is, do you want to be more like me or more like them? <laughs> the idea of diversification makes sense to a point. If you don't know what you're doing and you want the standard result and not be embarrassed, well, of course, you can widely diversify. Now, you, nobody's entitled to a lot of money for recognizing that because it's a truism. It's like knowing that two and two equals four. And, but the investment professionals think they're helping you by arranging a diversification. An idiot could diversify a portfolio, and, or a computer for that matter. But the whole trick of the game is to have, have a few times when you know that something is better than average and uh, invest only where you have that extra knowledge. And then if you get just a few opportunities, that's enough. Uh, what the hell does you care? You own three securities and J.P. Morgan Chase owns 100. You know, it, it's, what's wrong with owning a few securities? Warren always says if you lived in a growing town and you owned stock in three of the best enterprises in the town, isn't that diversified enough? The answer is, of course it is. They're all wonderful places. And that fortunes formula, which got so famous, which was a formula to tell people how much to bet on each transaction if you had a, an edge. And of course, the bigger your edge, the more close the transaction was to a certain winner, the more you should bet. And of course, there's mathematics behind it. But of course it's true. It's perfectly possible to buy by only one thing, because the opportunity is so great and it's such a cinch, or only two or three. So the whole idea of diversification when you're looking for excellence is totally ridiculous. It doesn't work. It gives you an impossible task. What fun is it to do an impossible task over and over again? I find it agony. I just, who would want to do it? And, and I don't see why. My father had a client. Well, he was a lawyer in Omaha. He had a client whose husband had a little soap company. And the guy died, and my father sold the soap company. This woman was one of the richest people in town in the middle of the Depression. And what she had was a little soap company in a biggest mansion in Omaha's best neighborhood. And they sold the soap company. She had a mansion in the best neighborhood and $300,000. But $300,000 in 1930 something was an incredible amount of money. A little hamburger was a nickel, a big hamburger was a dime, and the all you can eat cafe in Omaha would, would feed you all you needed to stay alive for two bits a day. I mean, 300,000. Well, she didn't hire an investment counselor, she didn't do anything. She's a wonderful old woman. 
And she just took that and she divided it into five chunks. And she bought five stocks. I remember three of them because I probated her estate. And it was, one of them was General Electric, one was Dow, one was DuPont, and I forget the other two. And then she never changed those stocks. She never paid any advisors, she never did anything. And she bought some municipal bonds, she never spent her income. And she bought some municipal bonds from time to time with the, and you know, by the time she died in the 50s, she had a million and a half dollars. No costs, no expenses. And I said, how did you decide to do that? And she said, well, she said, I thought electricity and chemistry were the coming things. We just chunked it all in and sat on her ass. <laughs> I always liked that little woman. <laughs> My kind of a girl. <laughs> and, but it's, it's rare. You know, it's, but if you stop to think about it, think of all the expense and palaver that she didn't have to listen to and all the trouble she avoided and zero costs. And of course, what people don't realize because they're so mathematically illiterate is that if you make 5% and pay two of it to your advisors, you're not losing 40% of your future. You're losing 90%. Because over a long period of time, that little difference that causes a 90% disadvantage to you. So it's hugely important for somebody who's a long-term holder not to be paying a big annual toll out of the performance. And of course, there are a few big time advisors now who are using indexation very heavily. And of course, they're prospering mightily. And of course, every time they get somebody, it's just agony for the rest of the investment counseling business. And this is a very serious problem. And I think these people who are used to winning as old time value investors who are now just quitting the profession. That's a very understandable thing to do. I, I, I regard it as more noble than staying in, with, you know, playing along with the denial. It's, it's an interesting problem. As you can see, I'm trying not trying to make your morning. <laughs> I'm just trying to describe things the way they are. Why does Lee Lu succeed so mightily? Well, partly, he's sort of a Chinese Warren Buffett. That really helps. And, and partly, he's fishing in China, not in this over-searched, overpopulated, highly competitive American market. And there's still pockets of ignorance and lassitude in China that gave him some unusual opportunities. The first rule in fishing has always been fish where the fish are. And the second rule of fishing has always been, don't forget rule number one. <laughs> and, and, Lee Lu just went where the fishing was good. And the rest of us are like cod fishermen or trying to catch cod where the fish have been fished out. And it doesn't matter how much you work when there's that much competition. Every little idea I see in the world somewhere going after. I sat once on an investment committee at the University of Michigan. And in came one of their successful investors uh, located in London. And what had this investor done in London? He decided to invest in sub-Saharan Africa. And the only marginal securities were a few banks that traded in the pink sheets. So he would buy very tiny quantities of these banks. And every time some poor person got tired of having the money in the mattress and put it in a bank, he did a little better. And of course, he made a lot of money. He, nobody else was investing in little tiny banks in Africa. But the niche was soon filled. What the hell do you do for Encore after you put your class money in a bunch of little tiny banks in sub-Saharan Africa? The niche gets filled quickly. And, I, and how many wonderful niches are there going to be when some guy in London is buying all these tiny little bank stocks in Africa? It's hard. And, and then, if you take the modern world, where people are trying to teach you how to come in and trade actively in stocks, well, I regard that as roughly equivalent to trying to induce a bunch of young people to start off on heroin. 
It is really stupid. And when you're already rich, to make your money by encouraging people to get rich by trading. And then there are people on the TV, another wonderful place. And they say, I have this book that will teach you how to make 300% a year. And all you have to do is pay for shipping, and I will mail it <laughs> to you. How likely is it that a person who had suddenly found a way to make 300% a year would be trying to sell books on the internet <laughs> to you? <laughs> yeah, it's ridiculous. And yet, I've described modern commerce. And the people that do this all day think they're useful citizens. The advertising agents invent the lingo. And so in insurance, they say, well, they say, the two people who shifted from Geico to the Glotz Insurance Company save $400 each. What they don't tell you is there are only two such people in the whole United States, and they were both nuts. <laughs> but they mislead you on purpose, and, and I get tired of it. And I, I don't think it's right that we deliberately mislead people as much as we do. Let me tell you another story that I think is an interesting one about the modern life. But this goes back to a different time. And this man has this wonderful horse. And it's just a marvelous horse. It's got an easy gait and good looking and everything. It just works wonderfully. But also occasionally just gets so he's dangerous and vicious and causes enormous damage and trouble and breaks arms and legs for his rider and so on. And he goes to the vet and says, what can I do about this horse? And the vet says, that's a very easy problem and I'm glad to help you. He says, what should I do? And the man says, the next time your horse is behaving well, sell it. <laughs> well, think of how immoral that is. And haven't I just described what private equity has to do? <laughs> when private equity has to sell something that's really troublesome, they hire an investment banker. And what does the investment banker do? He makes a projection. <laughs> you can't, I, I have never seen such expertise in my whole life as is created in making projections in investment banking. There is no business so lousy it can't get a wonderful projection. <laughs> and, but is that a great way to make a living, to have phony projections and use it to make money out of people you look right into the eyes of? I would say no. And by and large, Warren and I, we never tried to make money out of dumb, say, out of stupidity of our dumb buyers. We tried to make money by buying. And if we were selling horse shit, we didn't want to pretend it was a cure for arthritis. And, 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 and I think it's better to go through life our way instead of theirs. I think it's always been this way. I think there's always been chicanery. Think of the carnivals, of the, the carny operator. Think how much trickery there is in a carny operation. And people just seek out the weaknesses of their fellow man and take advantage. And you have to get wise enough so you, you avoid them all. You can't avoid them if they're in your family. I have no solution to that one. <laughs> but, but where you have a fair choice. There are just so many people that should be avoided. My father had this best friend and client, and he also had this other client who was a big blowhard, and, and he was always working for the big blowhard, and he wasn't ever working for his wonderful client whom I admired. And I said, why do you do this? And he said, Charlie, you idiot. He says, the big blowhard is an endless source of legal troubles. He's all, always in trouble, overreaching and misbehaving and so forth. Whereas he says, Grant McFadden treats everybody right, the employees, the customers, and everything. And he gets involved with some psychotic. He walks over there and makes a graceful exit immediately. So a man like that doesn't need a lawyer. <laughs> and my father was trying to teach me something, and it really worked. I spent my whole life trying to be like Grant McFadden. And I want to tell you, it works. It really works. Peter Hoffman is always telling me if the crooks only knew how much money you could make by being honest, 
they'd all behave differently. It, it's, Warren has a wonderful saying I like. He says, if you take the high road, it's never crowded. <laughs> and, and it's work. Take the Daily Journal Corporation. We made quite a few millions of dollars out of the foreclosure boom because we published legal notices and we dominated the publication of foreclosure notices in the worst real estate depression in the history of modern times. And we could have raised our prices at the time and made more tens of millions of dollars, but we didn't do it. You know, when your fellow citizens are losing their damn houses in the worst recession, Charlie Munger billionaire raises prices. If it would look lousy on the front page of the paper if people were on the honest way, should you do it? And the answer is no, of course not. Particularly when you're, Warren always said it's a, probably always a mistake to marry for money and it's really stupid if you're already rich. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's really stupid when you're already rich to get a reputation of being a total no good Nick. Rick Guerin always loved the story about the guy who had been a total miscreant all his life and he died and the minister said, now is the time in the funeral ceremony when somebody says something nice about the deceased. And nobody came forward and nobody came forward and nobody came forward. Finally, one guy stood up and he said, well, he said his brother was worse. <laughs> Well, you can laugh, but there are people like that. When Harry Cohn died here, the, the saying was, uh, everybody went to the funeral to make sure he was dead. <laughs> and, and so it's, there are a few simple truths that really work. And, and when it gets to this difficult business the Daily Journal is in, I would say it is a real pleasure to be serving these courts and agencies. They need the automation. Other people are trying to take advantage of them in ways that we aren't. And we're struggling against the odds, a little tiny company. And, and we're t taking a lot of territory. It's slow going. But the prospects are, are good. And of course, the nice thing about being rich is it doesn't matter if it's a little slow. And, and how did we get rich? Well, we remembered Grandpa Ingham, and when one of the few opportunities came along, we reached out and seized it. Think of how your life works. In my life, to give another example, the Mungers would have twice the assets they now have if I hadn't made one mistake of omission back in the 1970s. And really stupid. And I, got, I blew an opportunity that would have doubled my present net worth. That is a normal life. You get one or two. And how things work out, it's the basis. We all know people that are outmarried. That, I mean, their spouses are so much better. Think what a good decision that was for them. <laughs> and what a lucky decision. Way more important than money. And... A lot of them did it when they were young, just they stumbled into it. Now, you don't have to stumble into it. You can be very careful. A lot of people are wearing signs, danger, danger, do not touch, and people just charge right ahead. That's a mistake. <laughs> well, you can laugh, but <laughs> it's still a horrible mistake. It's been fun for the people on this board to know one another and work on these oddball things and to handle life's vicissitudes. Of course, it's very peculiar that we're so old. I mean, imagine a place where Gary Wilcox is one of the young men. And his wife is still a golf champion, but that's not because she's good when she's old. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's, it, it's an amazing group, and that's an interesting example, too. Imagine being as old and as impaired as I am and having a pretty good time. How does that happen? Well, you, that is another story. I tell a couple of other stories, too, because you like stories. Here's an apocryphal story that is very instructive. 
a young man comes to visit Mozart. And he says, Mozart, he says, I want to write symphonies. And Mozart says, how old are you? And the man says, I'm 23. And Mozart says, you're too young to write symphonies. And he says, but Mozart, he says, you were writing symphonies when you were 10 years old. And Mozart says, yes, but I wasn't asking other people how to do it. <laughs> now there's another Mozart story. Here's the greatest musical talent maybe that ever lived. And what was his life like? Well, he was bitterly unhappy, and he died young. That's the life of Mozart. What the hell did Mozart do to screw it up? To make himself, well, he did two things that are guaranteed to create a lot of misery. He overspent his income scrupulously. That's number one. That is really stupid. And the other thing was he was full of jealousies and resentments. If you'll spend, overspend your income and be full of jealousy and resentments, you can have a lousy, unhappy life and die young. All you've got to do is learn from Mozart. <laughs> you can also learn from that young man who was asking Mozart how to write symphony. The truth of the matter is that not everybody can learn everything. Some people are way the hell better. And of course, no matter how hard you try, there's always some guy that achieves more, some guy or gal. And the Maya answer is, so what? Do it. Does any of us need to be the very top of the whole world? It's ridiculous. And another thing that people do that I regard as amazing is they build these enormous mausoleums. I think they figure they want people to walk by that mausoleum and say, gosh, I wish I were in there. Anyway, uh, you can see we've had some fun as we go along. And it's worked so well, but if you actually figure out how many decisions were made in the history of the Daily Journal Corporation or the history of Berkshire Hathaway, it wasn't very many per year that were meaningful. It's a game of being there all the time and recognizing the rare opportunity when it comes and recognizing that a normal human allotment is to not have very many. Now, there's a very competent bunch of people who sell securities who act as though they've got an endless supply of wonderful opportunities. Well, those people are the equivalent of the racetrack tout. They're not even respectable. It's not a good way to live your life to pretend to know a lot of stuff you don't know and pretend to furnish you a lot of opportunities you're not furnishing. And my advice to you is avoid those people, but not if you're running a stock brokerage firm. You need them. But it's not the right way to make money. And, and this business of, of controlling the costs and living simply, and that was the secret. How much money? Warren and I had tiny little bits of money. We always underspent our incomes, and we invested, and we, well, you know, if you live long enough, you end up rich. It's not very complicated. Now, there is a part of life which is, how do you scramble out of your mistakes without them costing too much? And we've done some of that, too. And if you look at Berkshire Hathaway, think of its founding businesses, a doomed department store, a doomed New England textile company, and a doomed trading stamp company. Out of that came Berkshire Hathaway. No, we handled those losing hands pretty well, and we bought into them very cheaply. But of course, the success came from changing our ways and getting into the better businesses. It isn't that we were so good at doing things that were difficult. We were good at avoiding things that were difficult, finding things that are easy. By the way, when we bought the Daily Journal, that was easy. And what we're doing now in this software business is difficult. But due to the accident of these good associations and the fact that these old colleagues have lived so long, we're doing pretty well in the new business. It has potential, and it's fun to do. And, and uh, how many declining newspapers have hundreds of millions of marketable securities lying around and a new business with some promise? We're like the last of the Mohicans. That's right, for Jerry. Oh, 
He's giving it to somebody important. Well, I'll take some questions now. Well, I can't answer that question. I don't know the other six companies. And, but I would say, generally speaking, as things have gotten tougher, we've been better at sitting on our ass with what we have than we have in buying new ones. It's been hard to buy new ones. We haven't bought a whole company of any size since we bought the uh, truck stop operator. So if, if you're having trouble with the present time with anything, join the club. Oh, well. <laughs> Rick tells a story about an old Irishman that used to steal from the church and drunk all the time. And when he was dying, the priest asked him to renounce the devil. And he said, I can't do that because in my condition, I shouldn't offend anybody. And, and I don't think I should. If you get me started on politicians, I may be impolitic. So let's go to another subject. If you look at banks with assets greater than about a billion dollars in the US, and go up and sort of stop at the uh, super regional level. There's about 250 of those banks. Is that an, a hunting ground that you would think, applying the principles uh, of value investing, that is likely to maybe yield one or two you know, great businesses at a, at, a, at a... Well, thank you for answering that question. The answer is yes. <laughs> Contracts or possible contracts in every stage you can imagine. And it's very complicated. And I don't purport to understand each one because I've oh, trusted Jerry and the people who are doing it. But generally speaking, I can see that the trend is favorable. But more than that, I can only say you would be horrified if you watched it up close, how difficult it is. It's difficult. But in spite of its difficulties, we're doing pretty well. But we, we haven't got any magic wand. If you read all the reports, if I read all the reports in great detail and spent all my effort trying to understand it, I wouldn't understand it very well. So I think your chances are very poor. Thank you. Yeah. 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 One of my favorite lines from you is you want to hire the guy with the IQ of 130 that thinks it's 120, and the guy with an IQ of 150 who thinks it's 170 will just kill you. You must be thinking about Elon Musk. <laughs> How do you assess someone when making a hiring decision? Of course I want the guy who understands his limitations instead of the guy who doesn't. On the other hand, I've learned something terribly important in life. I learned that from Howard Amundsen. You know what he used to say? Never underestimate the man who overestimates himself. These weird guys who overestimate themselves occasionally knock it right out of the park. And, and that is a very unhappy part of modern life. But I've learned to adjust to it. I have no alternative. It happens all the time. But I don't want my personal life to be a bunch of guys who are living in a state of delusion, who happen occasionally to win big. I, I, I want the prudent person. Well, I did it because he asked me. And I sometimes do that. I'm foolish that way. <laughs> and I said what I believed when they asked me the questions. The answer is Lilu is not a normal. He's the Chinese Warren Buffett. He's very talented. And of course, I've enjoyed backing him. But it's interesting that way. I'm 95 years old. I've given Munger money to some outsider to run once in 95 years. And it's Lee Lu, of course, who's hit it out of the park. Yeah. It's very remarkable, but it's also pretty picky. <laughs> and of course, once I've got Lee Lu, if I'm comparing to him, who else am I going to pick? And by the way, that's a good way to make decisions. And that's what we do. If we've got one thing we can do more of, we're not interested in anything that's not better than that. That simplifies life a great deal. Because there aren't that many people better than Lee Lu.
So I just sit. It's amazing how intelligent it is to spend some time just sitting. A lot of people are way too active. You said in the past that you expect the U.S. to adopt a single-payer health care system or Medicare for all the next time Democrats control all three branches of government. I do, yes. What will this mean for health insurers, hospitals, and medical device companies? Well, it'll be a hell of a mess. <laughs> it'll still be a big business, but it will be a hell of a mess. And the existing system is so overexpensive and overcomplicated and has so much unnecessary cost, so much unnecessary overtreatment of the dying, so much overtreatment of items that would be best left alone, so much unnecessary expense. Uh, yet on the other hand, it's the best system there is in the world in terms of the quality of the top. So it's a very complicated subject, but it's a hell of a mess. I find it demoralizing to see. In Singapore, they spend 20% of what we spend in America on medical care, and their system is way better. And what they're doing is just the most elemental common sense. But of course, it was created by one Chinese guy who was in control. Of course, it's more intelligent than our, the outcome of our political process. That Singapore system was created by the Lee Kuan Yew. Of course, it works better. But to have it cost 20% and work better in an advanced place like Singapore. So there's a lot to be demoralized about in terms of the potential of our medical care system. And of course, it isn't that our politicians are good at fixing systems like that. So if you don't like it now, I confidently predict you won't like it later either. I read a lot of the Stoic philosophers last year, Epictetus, Seneca, Marcus Well, I can Aurelius. see why you would. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot to be Stoic about. <laughs> Agreed. And, and as I gleaned lessons from them, there was one name that kept coming to mind, and that is Munger, Munger, Munger. So I wonder, can you talk now, about... Some people think Marcus Aurelius was all right. <laughs> <laughs> Can you talk to me about the influence that the Stoics had on you and a lot, some of your, some of your favorite advice from them? A lot. A lot have it had a lot on me, including Epictetus, who started as a slave. No, I like those old Stoics. And part of the, of the secret of a long life that's worked as well as mine is not to expect too much of human nature. It's, it's almost, bound to, there's almost bound to be a lot of defects and problems. And to have your life full of seething resentments and hatreds, it's counterproductive. You're punishing yourself and not fixing the world. Can you think of anything much more stupid than trying to fix the world in a way that ruins yourself and doesn't fix the world? It's pretty stupid. I just don't do it. I. I I have a rule for politicians, and it's, it's a stoic rule. And, and I quit claiming to use it as this work rule so well for me. I always reflect that the politicians are never so bad, you don't live to want them back. When I was young, the California legislature was full of small-time insurance brokers and lawyers looking for an unfair advantage. And they were being entered by restaurants and pro with prostitutes and bars, by racetracks and liquor distributors and so on and so on. Fade in, fade out. We have a different kind of a legislature now. And I just want all those old crooks and lobbyists and prostitutes back. <laughs> oh, you laugh, but... You young people, you're going to live to wish we could have that Nancy Pelosi and Donald Trump were immortal. <laughs>
it's so obvious, all, some of these pithy stories. The storytelling really works to get messages around. One of the interesting things is look at our modern politicians and then think about Abraham Lincoln. Who in our modern politician reminds you of Abraham Lincoln in either party? Lincoln at one time was hired by some guy whose partner had died, leaving practically no, no money and wife and three children. And he owed some money to his surviving partner. And the surviving partner came to Lincoln and said, I want you to collect this money. And Lincoln said to this guy, he said, well, he says, you look like an enterprising fellow who can get that much money back pretty easily through a little effort. And if you want to wring a little money out of this poor widow and her three children, you'll have to get a different kind of lawyer. Does that remind you of any of our modern politicians? That was Abraham Lincoln. What a story. No wonder he's remembered. And you know who deserves the credit for Abraham Lincoln and never gets it? It's his stepmother. Abraham Lincoln was the child of two illiterates. But the stepmother, who his father just admired in desperation to help raise the children, she took a shine to Lincoln and saw he was bookish, and she helped him all the way along. I'm going to donate a picture of that stepmother eventually to a particular place because I'm, I admire what that stepmother accomplished in life. Imagine being responsible more than any other person for the life of Abraham Lincoln. Is there a better way to share intellectual property across nations, especially in the case of Huawei? Is the bitter fight a better legal framework to handle intellectual properties? Well, you know, I don't know that much about the world of intellectual property. I've made my way in insurance and furniture stores and, and little legal newspapers and so on. And, and so other people are good at intellectual and are good at it intellectual property. I'm good at avoiding subjects, which I'm not good at. And one of them is intellectual property. I'm not surprised that the Chinese are stealing a little intellectual property. We Americans did it all the time. We stole Dickens' work. We didn't copy it. We just took, reprinted his copyrighted stuff. Uh, in our, we stole the technology from the English textile manufacturers. You know, it isn't as though the people haven't been pretty aggressive about wanting to know other people's ideas. This is an old problem. I do think that, that allowing intellectual property to have these profits is desirable. But the exact complexities of how you handle it, I don't spend much time thinking about. In last year's daily journal meeting, you talked about one of the five aces of a money manager was a long runway. Yes. I'm, I'm young and have at least, hopefully, a 40-year runway ahead of me. I'd well, like how to- How are your legs? Um, I passed my physical with uh, flying colors, so thanks a lot. Um, I'd like to compound my money at the highest rate and then give most of it away at the end. Which money managers would you recommend besides you and Warren? Thank you. Well, I just said I've only hired one myself in a lifetime. I don't think that makes me an expert. Although I must say that one did work out rather well. No, I, I can't help you. <laughs> Everybody would like to have some money manager that would make him rich. Think of how, how, of course we all would want that. I would like to be able to turn lead into gold, but it's hard. It's very hard. And if you're finding it difficult, that just shows you understand it. I don't have a question. I just want to thank you both for putting together P uh, Poor Charlie's Almanac. It has been an incredibly foundational book in my life and uh, has really helped inflect my thinking on many different things. So thank you both very much for your work on that. Well. You're really, it was Peter Kaufman's idea. He did the whole damn thing. 
and he paid for it himself, being a rich and eccentric man. <laughs> and, and I just wish there was one change in Peter Kaufman. Peter Kaufman has made me adored in India and China. I wish the hell he could do more for me in Los Angeles. <laughs> The Chinese version of Bert Charlie's Almanac has been pirated enormously in China, totally pirated. But what, the legal sales are, what, 340,000 or something. Peter's made me very popular in China, but he does nothing for me in Los Angeles. <laughs> You've paraphrased Ben Graham in saying that good ideas are wonderful, uh, but you can suffer terribly if you overdo them. How yes. Do you, how do you balance that against... Uh, the risk that you potentially forego an opportunity altogether or are late to enter into an opportunity for fear of that materializing? Well, the uh, problem is thoroughly understood is half solved. The minute you point out there's a big tension between good ideas that get overdone so much they're dangerous and good ideas that still have a lot of run, runway ahead. Once you have that construct in your head and start classifying opportunities into one category or the other, you've got the problem half solved. You don't need me. You've already figured it out. You've got to be aware of both potentialities and the tensions. Why is it that Berkshire's organizational principles as a holding company have not been copied more by others given its incredible success and track record? Thank you. Well, it's a good question. I think the main reason is it looks impossible. If you were in Procter & Gamble, with its culture and its bureaucracy, and you sat down and figured, how can I make Procter & Gamble more like Berkshire Hathaway? It would go immediately to the too hard pile. It's just too hard. There's too much momentum. But you raise, by your question, a very interesting thing that deserves uh, more attention than it gets. One of the reasons that Berkshire has been so successful is there's practically nobody at headquarters. We have almost no corporate bureaucracy. We have a few internal auditors who go out from there and check this or that. But basically, we have no bureaucracy. Having no bureaucracy is a huge advantage if the people who are running it are sensible people. Think of how poorly all of us have behaved in big bureaucracy, even though we have a lot of talent, because we couldn't change anything. So bureaucracy has a standard bunch of evils and a standard bunch of stupid wastes and so forth. And avoiding it is hugely important. And of course, the tendency of successful places, particularly successful government places, is to have more and more bureaucracy. And of course, it's terribly counterproductive. And of course, the bureaucracy, the individual bureaucrats, they're benefiting from more assistance, more meetings, more this, more that. So what looks like poison to us from the outside, because the decisions are so terrible, looks wonderful for them. It's opportunity. And I've just described the great tragedy of modern life. Modern life creates successful bureaucracy, and successful bureaucracy means failure and stupidity. How could it be otherwise? That's the big tension of modern life. And some of these places that go into a stupid bureaucracy and fire a third of the people and then the place works better, they're doing the Lord's work, but you wouldn't think so if you were working there. And, but the, there's a lot of there's a lot of horror and waste in bureaucracy, and it's inevitable. It's as natural as old age and death. With that cheerful thought, we can go on to the next one. Well, yes, I'll tell you what makes a partnership successful. Two talented people <laughs> working <laughs> well together. Of course that works better. Well, you got to remember that I was old when general technologies came into being. I guess had a weak moment in Warren, and Garen talked me into it. And, 
And it worked because Jerry took a hold of it and worked miracles. So I don't deserve much credit. It's Garen and, and Salzman who were responsible for journal technology. I just clap. <laughs> I'm good at clapping. Well, other than China, but if there's one good place in the world, that's more than my share. There are others, I'm sure, but it's hard for me to believe that anything could be better for the mongers than China. So I can't help you. I've solved my problem. You'll have to solve yours. <laughs> By the way, the water's fine in China. And some very smart people are wading in. And in due course, I think more will wade in. The great companies of China are cheaper than the great companies in the United States. My advice for a seeker of compound interest that works ideally is to reduce your expectations, because I think it's going to be tougher for a while. And it helps to have realistic expectations, makes you less crazy. You know, they say that common stocks from the aftermath of the Great Depression, which was the worst in the English-speaking world in hundreds of years, to the present time, maybe an index has produced 10%, but that's pre-inflation. After inflation, it may be 7% or something. And the difference between 7 and 10 in terms of its consequences are just hugely dramatic over that long period of time. And if that seven in real terms that may have been achieved starting at a perfect period and through the greatest boom in history, starting now, it could well be 3% or 2% in real terms. I mean, it's not unthinkable you'd have 5% returns and 3% inflation or some ghastly consequences like that. And so the ideal way to cope with that is to say if it handles, if that happens, I can have a happy life. Because why shouldn't you be happy in spite of the fact that the civilization wasn't quite as easy as it was for my generation? And now beyond that, when it gets more difficult, how should you do it? Well, the answer is because it's going to be very difficult, you should work at it. And if all that gets you is 6% for a lifetime of work instead of 5 you should be cheerful about it. If you want to hit it out of the park easily, you should talk to Jim Kramer. <laughs> I was wondering if uh, we could ask the other board members about the long-term succession plan for the board. I don't think we want to go to a, another speaker. <laughs> I think Warren was, well, after all, a mere boy of 89, thinks that Berkshire can do a little better than the S&P. <laughs> From this point, I don't think many people can, but he may be right about himself and the team he has in place. It won't be by huge margins. That I confidently predict. No, I don't. I don't. I don't think. I don't think the world would be improved by more comments from me on Apple. <laughs> you know, I'm a very opinionated man, and I know a lot, but I don't know everything. I like Apple, but I don't have the feeling that I'm the big expert. I am 11 years old and I come from China. My question is also well, about- you're certainly welcome here. 
Last year, you said that you wish you had more of Apple stock, but now its price has declined by a lot. So what is your opinion about its moat or the competitive advantage? Why do you think it has declined? Well, I don't know why Apple stock is going up or down. I know enough about it, so I admire the place. But I don't know enough to, to have any big opinion about why it's going up or down recently. Part of our secret is that we don't attempt to know a lot of things. We have a, I have a pile on my desk that solves most of my problem. It's called the too hard pile. <laughs> and I just keep shifting things to the too hard pile. <laughs> and every once in a while, an easy decision comes along and I make it. That's my system. Everything was the too hard pile, except for a few easy decisions which I make promptly. Well, we pay attention to qualitative metrics, and we also pay attention to other factors. Generally, we like to pay attention to whatever is important in the particular situation, and that varies from situation to situation. We're just trying to have that uncommon sense I'm talking about. And part of our uncommon sense is just to refer a lot of stuff to the too hard pile. The simple life is the obvious right answer, but most of America ends up like Mozart, in debt and overspending. How do you maintain the discipline to live the simple life in the face of all these other temptations? I was born this way. <laughs> I think infrastructure will be a big deal, practically everybody. In China, where BYD is so active, and by the way, the Daily Journal owns some BYD, but BYD is going to be huge in electric vehicles. They're already huge, and they're going to be much more huge. And then they're going to be huge in monorails, which is also a business whose time has come. And they're also huge in these lithium batteries, and the lithium batteries are being improved and materially improved. The place is full of fanatics. And by the way, they're a big supplier to Apple and Huawei. And, and they're a very satisfactory supplier to those things. So I am terribly impressed with BYD. It's been one of the real pleasures of my life to, to Wan Chan Fu is the eighth son of a peasant. An older brother recognizing a genius had been born into the family. He just gave up everything in life to nurture that little brother genius. Now that's Confucianism. And by the way, Confucianism will do a lot better for civilization than the Ford Foundation did. You know, I mean, Confucianism with a strong family ethos like that is a really constructive thing. And Confucianism partly created BYD. That older brother of Wan Chan Fu's was a hero. And of course, what Wan Chan Fu has done is a miracle. And of course, that was a venture capital type investment. We bought marketable securities, not Berkshire, but, but uh, Liu, Liu did. And it's been a wonderful investment. And it's been a very admirable company. And, and I like being part of something that's inventing better lithium, lithium batteries and better monorails and, and so on and so on. So if you work for BYD, you're a very fortunate person. And you're going to have a wonderful life watching and participating. You could hardly have a better employer, at least if you like demanding achievement in 80-hour weeks. When you had an opportunity to raise prices, you didn't want to raise them during the Great Recession because it didn't seem right for Charlie Munger to be raising prices on people that were losing their houses. So I wanted to thank you for that as well. And I wanted to ask you about Nobody the... Nobody else ever has. <laughs> I wanted to um, ask you about the causes of the Great Recession, specifically the credit ratings agencies. In your 24 um, standard causes of human misjudgment, I think they hit them pretty much all. The Pavlovian Association, well, you're, you're right denial. About, you're right about that. The financial behavior in our leading financial institutions was inexcusably awful. And when other people were making money in a disreputable, stupid fashion, Everybody piled in because they didn't want somebody else to be making money and they're not participating. 
the standards in lending, the standards in managing. It was disgusting intellectually, disgusting morally. And of course, it caused a whirlwind that could have taken the whole civilization down into a Great Depression. And, and that's a pretty major sin. And none of those people have been punished. I, it's unusual. That I agree so thoroughly with Elizabeth Warren, but I was wrong to have that big a mess and have nobody punished. I've written a blueprint for a nonprofit credit ratings agency. I'm not going to ask for your money because I understand you're invested in Moody's and you probably do not want to give money to a nonprofit that's going to spend some time possibly criticizing Moody's ratings. But I'd love to get your feedback. It's only 10 pages. I'll hand it to your people after the event. Thank you. What is the feedback on? The feedback on a blueprint that I've written for a nonprofit credit ratings agency. It would be a verifier of ratings issued oh, by well, Moody's. Oh, well, that is a very... Things that far out, I usually leave to other people. You know, and not because Berkshire Hathaway owns a big chunk of one of the credit rating agencies, but I can see why the existing situation would draw, you, draw your concern. But there's some human problems I don't want to bother with. And you have just produced one. But you're right, it wasn't perfect. Well, that's a very interesting question. The whole science of economics had no idea 15 years ago that it would be possible to print money on the present scale and get so awash in internal debt as we have. And certainly, in a place like Japan, which is way more extreme, nobody dreamed that was possible. And the people who did dream it was possible, and they were few, uh, they would not have predicted 20 years of stasis in spite of everything the Japanese did, which was very extreme. There's a lot that's peculiar in what we're doing. And eventually, if you try and solve all your problems by printing money, there'll be some disaster. And when it's coming and how bad it will be, nobody knows. Nobody dreamed 15 years ago we could do as much as we have now with this little bad consequence. And so the, Churchill used to say that Clement Attlee had a lot to be modest about. Well, that's the way I feel about the economics profession. They have a lot to be modest about. They, they thought they knew a lot that turned out not to, be so, not to be so. And there was a Greek philosopher that said no man steps in the same river twice. You know, the river is different the second time he comes in and so is the man. And that's the way with economics. It's not like physics where the same damn principles are going to apply. You do the same damn thing at a different time and you get a different result. It's complicated. And of course you're raising a very important question. And of course, nobody really knows the answer. Who knows how much of this we can get by with. My personal bet is that these democracies will eventually borrow too much and cause some real troubles. I don't know when. How do you tell, like, for example, when you look at a um your money manager or a uh, management company that you're investing in, if they have the right character or the right integrity, how long does that take you to do that? And what are some traits that you look for? Well, now that I find Lulu, I don't look for anybody else. <laughs> so I'm the wrong person. What, how, what are my chances I'm going to get somebody better than Lulu? Yeah, so I, it's very easy for me. What you need is a Lulu, and I don't know how to get you one. Well, generally speaking, I'm restrained in my enthusiasm for politicians telling corporations what they should do. But I will say this. When it was a very good idea for companies to buy back their stock, they didn't do very much. And when the stocks got so high priced that it's frequently a bad idea, they're doing a lot. Welcome to adult life. <laughs> this is the way it is. But it's questionable at the present levels, whether a lot of it is smart. Was Eddie Lambert smart to buy back so much shares of Roebuck? No. And a lot of, there's a lot of that kind of mistake that's been made. 
What advice would you have for someone my age looking to live a long, successful life like yourself? I haven't had that much success changing any of my children. <laughs> and I don't think I can change them, give helpful advice to a perfect stranger. It's hard to improve the next generation. And the standard result is going to be mediocre. And some people are going to succeed. They're going to be few. That's the way human significance is a lot of the Human significance will always go to the few. There's no way of creating enough human significance to meet the demand. And I think personal discipline, personal morality, good colleagues, good ideas, all the simple stuff. I'd say if you want to carry one message from Charlie Munger, it's this. If it's trite, it's right. All those old virtues are, they all work. You point out a great deal of human folly, yes. but seem to have a sense of humor rather than anger or upsetness about it. Is that a correct perception, and has that always yeah, been the that, case you for you? It's a very correct perception. It's my system. I've copied it from the Jews. <laughs> I saw it work well from them, and it was my natural inclination anyway. And so, yeah, no, I, 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 yeah, humor is my way of coping. What is your proudest accomplishment in life, and why? I don't have a single accomplishment in life that I'm all that proud of. I set out to try and have more uncommon sense than most. Pretty limited objective. And I'm pleased I did as well as I did in that game. And if I had to do all over again, I think it would be a lot harder. I think part of my success was being born in the right place in the right time. So. I'm not particularly proud of success that came from being born in the right place at the right time. I'm pleased, but not, but not proud. Mr. Salzman, I have a question for you. Uh, I was wondering if you could please comment on how journal technologies implements the invariant strategy principles, things like trust, getting employees to go all in, positive sum, and win-win relationships. Jerry, that's a simple question. How do you solve the problems of God? <laughs> yeah. First of all, you have to deal with each individual, because each, each individual, each employee, each ind independent contractor that we have to work with, each client is different. And so you have to relate to their specific circumstance. You do not handle it because it's in a checklist or something. Charlie once said, um, any year that you don't destroy one of your best loved ideas is probably a wasted year. And I'd like to ask if you, both of you destroy any of your beloved idea in 2018. Karen, have you destroyed any idea in 2018? Say again, I wasn't listening. He, yes, if you, <laughs> if you have destroyed any good ideas in, in 2018. Destroyed any? Yes. Eliminated, probably. Probably unbeknownst to me. <laughs> How about you? Now, we always think into the future. We're not worried about the past. Just that simple. The day ends, we're on to something different. And it's a different challenge every day. And the good part about my job, it changes every day. So I face something different. <coughs> I'm a, like, like a newspaper editor. I start with a bank, blank page every day. Well, how do I go to the next situation? How do I solve a particular problem? That's my day. That's what I do. What made you decide to buy Wells Fargo in March of 2009 instead of October of 2008? Well, I had the money in the later period. <laughs> and, and the stock was cheaper. Those are two very important <laughs> parts of the purchase. You've started some new real estate developments? No, I bought some apartment houses. For bought my, apartment for, houses. From my, for my uh, grandchildren. I heard about, about Seemed building. Seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> What's the key to their success then? 
the apartment house is doing well. By the way, that phrase, it seemed like a good idea at the time, came to me from a man I knew many years ago. In five minutes between trains, he managed to conceive an illegitimate child by somebody he met in the power car, the bar car. <laughs> and my father was asked by the young man's father, he had a nice wife and three children, what on hell were you thinking about? And you know what the young man said? It seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> Herb Kelleher um, passed away recently, and I'm hoping that maybe you have some anecdotes about Herb that you would like to share with us. Thank you. Who? Herb Kelleher, the founder of oh, Southwest yeah. Airlines. Yeah, well, well, he was a very remarkable businessman. I never knew him, but he was, uh, he was an original, and he created an amazingly sound company while drinking one hell of a lot of whiskey and smoking a hell of a lot of cigarettes. This is not my personal style. <laughs> and to do as well as he did with so much bourbon and so many cigarettes, it set a new record in human life. <laughs> so we should all remember Herb Kelleher. And we all wish we could have so much strength that we could abuse it so much and still, still perform. It wasn't, I, I didn't get such a hand. I regard him as a miracle. Would you feel comfortable investing in the American depository shares of most Chinese companies that are comprised of a VIA structure and offer shareholders few rights and minimal protections from the Chinese government? I don't know much about depository shares. I tend to be suspicious of all investment products created by professionals. And I tend to go where Nothing is being hawked aggressively or merchandised aggressively or sold aggressively. So you're talking about a world in which I don't even enter. So I can't help you. You're talking about a territory I avoid. All intelligent investors worry about banks because banks present temptations to their managers to do dumb things. There's so many things you can easily do in a bank that looks like a cinch way of reporting more earnings soon, where it's a mistake to do it, long-term considerations being properly considered. As Warren puts it, the trouble with banking is there are more banks than there are good bankers. And, and he's right about that. So I would say if you invest in banks, you have to go into the time when you've got a lot going for you because there'll be a fair amount of stupidity that creeps into banking. What's your best recommendation for dealing with somebody who not only won't negotiate rationally, but will also criticize you for trying to negotiate rationally? You're talking about a situation I try and solve by avoidance. <laughs> if I could solve that problem, I'd have a line around the block. I mean, you wouldn't be able to squeeze in here. Everybody who has an insoluble problem with a difficult person Think of what we'd all do to solve that one. I'm afraid I don't have a solution to that one. Avoidance is my principal method. Do you think early real world and early working experience help you, give you a strong advantage over other people in this investing profession? Could you elaborate Absolutely. on it? Absolutely. And the Just second I was able to learn from my dead grandfather, great grandfather, when I was a little boy. What I learned at a very young age, when I was just a kid, I could see some of the adults around me were nuts, and yet they were very talented. I could see how much irrationality there was in very talented people. And so I got interested in, in seeking out the patterns and understanding why it happened and learning tricks to cope and so on. And I did that when I was a little kid. And of course it helped me. Who is not helped by an early start in a promising activity? And what activity could be more promising than diagnosing stupidity? <laughs> what level of discount would you be applying to potential investments today? Well, generally speaking, I think the professional investors, they have to accept less than they were used to getting under different conditions. Just as an old man expects less out of his sex life than he had when he was 20. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> Why Berkshire did not have long-term investment in uh, General Dynamics, Teledyne, General Cinema, or Ralston Purina? Well, we did Purina. have a huge investment in General Dynamics for a long time, and we made an enormous amount of money with it. Well, after the defense business contracted, nobody else was willing to sell anything except General Dynamics, which kept selling at higher and higher prices. And Warren noticed that. And we had a huge position in General Dynamics and made a fortune. We always admired the founder of Teledyne, who was a genius, Henry Singleton. But uh, we admired him from afar. We never invested. It was just one of many mistakes of omission. I was happy to see you at this meeting, turn 90, now you're 95. And I hope if you, you think you're happy, think about it the way I feel. <laughs> Business and life can cause a lot of stress, like it did for Whitney Tilson, but you've always seemed to stay cool. What mental tools do you use to defocus and keep your equanimity for 95 years? How do you detach? And even during the Solomon Brothers scandal, were you always able to get eight hours of sleep at night? Well, that is not true. As a matter of fact, I had more difficulty sleeping when I was young. But I do have a tip that I've learned late in life. I never consciously blanked out my mind when I tried to go to sleep. And so I allowed my mind to wrestle through my problems and keep me awake very, very late while I lay in bed wrestling with problems. And then if I didn't sleep well one night, I figured, what the hell, I'll sleep the next night. But that was pretty stupid. Now I actually deliberately blank out my mind and I can go to sleep rather easily. And I recommend it to all of you. It really works. I don't know why the hell I didn't get to it before 93. <laughs>
He got an earlier start. He was probably a little smarter. He worked harder. There are not a lot of reasons. <laughs> Why it was Albert Einstein poorer than I was. <laughs> what you're missing is that there's more opportunities there than there is here. And I can't, yeah. I don't, I don't see how I could guide you any more firmly than that. Are you finding things so easy here you don't need China? <laughs> well, with that, we're through.